I wanted to talk about this paper for a while. It's um, it's about Botrytis, Botrytis scenaria, the gray mold. A lot of people are familiar with it. It's a fungal pathogen that infests many, many, many different crops, different species of plants. Um, and in particular, I wanted to mention also, before I talk about this subject, that uh, recently, and in the video that I made about Botrytis scenario on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol, which all of you will be able to see if you uh, subscribe to my channel, and this is also where this video is going to be going as well, that there are also cryptic species, um, related species that look so similar to Botrytis scenario that people don't realize that they are different, actually. Um, that were recently discovered. So, um, in addition to Botrytis cinerea, there's also um, uh, a few other species that I don't actually necessarily remember off the top of my head, but I wanted to mention that because it's sort of an interesting thing, but go check out my video if you want to learn more about that. But this video is going to be about something else. Um, I have a research report in front of me on my computer called Genome Characterization of a debilitation-associated mitovirus infecting the phytopathogenic fungus Botrytis scenario. This was um, published in 2010, and it goes over a fungal virus. Yes, for people who don't know, fungi can definitely be infected by viruses and bacteria and other fungi for that matter. Um, and I'll read the abstract here. The abstract reads, the full-length sequences of Botrytis scenaria, mitovirus 1, or BCMV1, and an associated RNA, an associated, an associated RNA, in strain, oh, in strain, uh, CANBC1C78 of Botrytis scenaria were determined. Sequence analysis showed that BCMV1 is 2,804 NTs long and is uh, AU rich, orum rich. Uh, BCMV1 shares 95% nucleotide sequence identity with Ophiostoma novo ulmi mitovirus 3b, which is a mouthful. However, it is 472 NTs longer than the than Ophiostoma novo ulti, uh, ulmi mitovirus 3b. Mitochondrial codon, ah, you guys. I'm going to stop myself. This is not really necessary. But what is necessary is the subject here. This mitovirus, which is also coincidentally also a mycovirus, um, is able to infest Botrytis scenario. And Botrytis scenario is a very common fungal pathogen that many people have to deal with and find incredibly difficult to do so. On some crops, it's a little bit easier to deal with. On other crops, it's incredibly devastating and can cause what would essentially be crop failure. Maybe it doesn't kill all the plants, but it can kill all of the produce, which essentially kills the farm um, if you have a bad year. And because Botrytis scenario infects like 200 plus species of plants, and probably many more than that, at least crop plants anyways, um, you know, finding ways to deal with this organism are paramount, right? Um, the more people we have on Earth, uh, the more it's important that we are able to deal with pathogens and also other things like food waste and um, being more environmentally sound and ecologically friendly in the way that we do these sorts of things. Instead of using a uh, broad spectrum fungicide, which I know many people are, have to do in some cases, uh, like an ornamental horticulture, for example, um, there are more biocontrol agents being used more and more. And I wonder. I wonder aloud to this live to this live stream if such a virus couldn't be used something like this against botrytis right because um, if you have an organism any kind of organism um, I guess it wouldn't be considered a biocontrol organism since viruses are often not considered alive although I'm not sure that I personally agree with that I mean it's true I suppose with, I mean, technically true, uh, under certain definitions of what life is. Um, kind of like prions. If you don't know what prions are, uh, prions are, um, uh, they're little packets of protein, essentially, that can um, self-form and they, and they really screw you up. Um, I think mad cow disease is a prion uh, disease, 
Prion disease are no joke. Incredibly transmutable or uh, uh, um, communicable, I should say. They are incredibly communicable to other organisms that are that are vulnerable, and um, there's pretty much no cure for them either. So they're a really big deal. But anyways, um, using a virus to take care of a pest is not a new concept. Certainly, it's been used pretty effectively um, against. Um, diamond black, or not diamond black, but uh, diamond back moth, um, and also a few other lepidopterous pests, different uh, moths. Their uh, larvae will feed on the leaves. You might spray this um, virus or whatever, and it's a um, it's a, a, a naturally effective uh, control agent essentially. So you spray it on the foliage. It doesn't infect humans. Most viruses that if, I mean, pretty much no viruses that affect plants that are phyto. Uh, pathogenic um, hurt people necessarily, um, but there there is one example of a virus, um, the pepper mild model virus, I believe it's called, <clears throat> and it uh, may be able to infect certain humans under some conditions, or at least be able to like subsist in our bodies, maybe not infect us necessarily. Um, the jury's still out on that. But, you know, it's kind of, it's a little bit scary to think about, wouldn't it be? Um, especially since pepper model, pepper mild model virus um, doesn't just infest peppers, it infests many other kinds of plants. And ostensibly, many plants are already, or could already be infected with it potentially, or the produce could be harvested from it, and maybe some people would be able to be infected, like the immunocompromised, for example. Um, but in the application of, like, biocontrol, essentially, you can use certain viruses um, that already infect those pests. Um, you can, like, basically aggregate them and apply them to crops and then kill the pest. But usually you have to find some sort of way to get it into the organism. And the way that most people do with Lepidopterous pests that way, with other biocontrol agents, like, a, um, like bacteria, for example, or fungi, is we either get direct contact, con contact onto the larva, or to get it into the foliage, and then the organism feeds on the foliage. Of course, you would rather something that contact kills, right? Because you don't have to wait for the organism to damage, even if it's ever so slightly, the, um, the host, which is your crop, right? But I think it's a really interesting concept to utilize something like this, um, this mitovirus to infect botrytis. If you had botrytis bud rot, or you had some other sort of um, uh, crop, so in cannabis, for example, but also like, I mean, I mean pick a crop, Botrytis probably infects it. Um, it's very, very ubiquitous in the environment. Um, but these viruses, perhaps somebody could utilize them in order to, um, uh, to, to destroy them. I suppose that if you were to do something like that, you would have to have the right carrier and you'd have to find a way to, um, uh, to what is what would essentially be to like rear the organism and I don't know enough about virology to really comment on how that would be possible or anything like that but I know that it's done for other viruses too like what are called RNA interference viruses so RNAi controls and I've talked about those a little bit before but essentially what that is it's, it's um, an organism that um, interferes is a virus that interferes with the physiology of the target host, and usually they're lepidopterans, they're moths and butterflies when they're larvae. And they work pretty well. They work pretty well. The problem is that um, they do have some limitations. For example, you have to apply them, right? Um, they're not like, I mean, they're native to the environment, but um, to, to really get use out of them, you have to like super concentrate them in the area where the uh, pest is going to interact with them, and they're usually going to interact with them by eating them, um, you know, uh, fac uh, not faculatively, but um, just by a matter of course, by herbivory. Um, let me read the introduction of this page, though. <clears throat> it says, hypo, not hyper, but hypovirulence refers to a debilitated or attenuated ability of some fungal strains in populations of a certain plant pathogenic fungus to infect and or co to colonize tissues of susceptible plants. 
This phenomenon has been recorded in numerous plant pathogenic fungi, including Botrytis cinerea, uh, the causal agent of plant gray mold disease. In most cases, fungal hypovirulence is associated with or caused by mycoviruses belonging to the families Hypoviridae, Rayoviridae, and Narnaviridae, or with some unclassified mycoviruses. Hypovirulent fungal strains can be potentially used as biocontrol agents to control virulent strains by transfer of certain hypovirulence elements or certain mycoviruses from hypovirulent to virulent strains through hyphal anastomosis. So, anastomosis. Uh, meanwhile, deciphering the interaction between fungal hosts and mycoviruses and the interaction between mycovirus-containing fungal strains and host plants at the molecular level might help to unveil the underlying mechanisms responsible for fungal pathogenesis. So that's pretty cool. I'll stop there. That's actually a pretty interesting idea too, is that you could, you could essentially contaminate the local population of whatever the fungus was, in this case, botrytis, but if it was like powdery mildews, for example, maybe the powdery mildews that infect cannabis or that infect um, uh, Gerbera daisies, for example, or citrus or um, roses or any, any number of plants. If you could uh, take strains of botrytis that, ha that are host to this, to this virus that causes a reduction in virulence, um, you could perhaps somehow find a way to transmit those strains and make them um, come into contact with the more virulent strains that aren't infected by the virus. If you are able to make that really widespread, what you could essentially do is you could have the current botrytis that are more of a problem uh, essentially revert, not revert, but um, convert into a... Uh, hypovirulent strain. And if that were the case, then those botrytis would become much, much less of a problem. It wouldn't kill them off necessarily or anything like that. But what it could do is it could make the current botrytis that people deal with much less of an issue, which I guess is just me repeating myself. I apologize. Um, let me continue. Numerous studies indicated that hypovirulence associated mycoviruses usually contain genomes of double-stranded RNA or single-strand RNA, which are either encapsidated within coat proteins to form virus particles or are maintained as unencapsidated unenca viral RNA without formation of virus particles. Due to the structural simplicity of mycoviruses, which, by the way, might make it a lot easier to um, uh, essentially raise or um, or keep in stasis or perhaps produce more of if it's a very simple structure. Um, there also might be ways to improve the virus as well and make it more virulent. Maybe you can make something that reduces the virulence in its host and maybe maybe even like is pathogenic and, and kills it, or well pathogenic, but is uh, um, lethal to the host. I'm actually not sure what would be better if you make the vi if you make a virus that makes the botrytis less virulent but also kills it eventually then um, passing it along might be a little bit more difficult but if you make the virus essentially neutralize the botrytis and make it so non virulent that um, it doesn't necessarily die but it's a, a it's way easier to deal with it might be more likely to be passed on, I suppose, because obviously something that kills the host is going to be a lot less problematic, or a lot more problematic, rather, than a virus that doesn't do that, you know? Um, but at the same time, if you could spray a virus that, like, kills it before the fungus even infects the host, that would be pretty cool. Where'd I leave off? Oh, due to the structural simplicity of mycoviruses, characterization of the full-length sequences of the mycoviral genomes is important for clarification of the taxonomic identity of mycoviruses. Myco oh, sorry. Moreover, understanding the genome organization and expression of mycoviruses 
can help to decipher the role of mycovirus infection in fungal hypovirulence and to exploit mycoviruses in bio- biological control of plant fungal diseases. I am obviously not the first per- person to think about this. They have two citations here. They have Choi and Ness from 1992, and they have anag- Anagnostachus from 1998. So certainly this, this, this certainly predates 2018 when this video is being uh, uh, shot. Mycoviruses usually replicate their genomes in the cytosol, which is the cytoplasm excluding organelles, or specifically inside mitochondria of fungal cells. Replication of the mycoviral genomes is catalyzed by the virally encoded RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, thus ensuring their persistent maintenance within fungal cells. So it's a mitochondrial fu- virus on top of that. So it infects the powerhouse of the cell, which makes sense if that's if the effect of that virus is that it's hypovirulent uh, inducing, essentially making, you know, taking away the teeth from the fungus. Then if it infects the mitochondria, I would expect to have major physiological problems potentially, and that would certainly be one of them. Um, However, internal deletions of mycoviral genomes were frequently detected during replication of some mycoviruses, including hypoviruses CHV1 EP713 and CHV3 GH2, which doesn't mean anything to me, in uh, Cryphonectria, Crypho- Cryphonectria parasitica, which I'm not familiar with as an organism. As a consequence, small defective RNAs were generated in, in a cryphonetrica parasitica strains infected with, hypo, with the hypovirus. Okay, so that's kind of interesting too. I guess I would expect that, right? That, um, you know, just like we have an immune system, fungi also have an immune system, plants have an immune system. Not the same kind of immune system, but they do have an immune system. And um, I guess you could expect that certain viruses might be uh, more or less affected by the innate immune systems of those organisms. But yeah, kind of a cool concept. I didn't really want to talk about uh, something that went uh, went on too long. Most of my lives, uh, Instagram has to tell me that it's time to go because you've been here for an hour and our servers can only hold, hold so much data, right? But I do find... Uh, and I really, I really like sharing this information. People are always giving me positive feedback when I bring up this sort of esoterica, this sort of technical information. Um, I love coming across it in research, but sometimes I just come across it because um, the the circles that I work in, um, they uh, they they often come across academic literature as it's coming out. This came out in 2010, however. I only became aware of it because I have a picture. I don't remember where I got this picture from. Maybe I got it from the American Phytopathology Society or somewhere. But it's um, I titled it as uh, Mycoviruses of Botrytis Scenario, specifically. Um, and I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've got seven viruses here in this picture. It's just like a, it's like a graph reference. Um, graph, it's a table graph reference. Um, and this one that we're talking about here is um, by Wu, and it's from 2010. Yeah, and so its genus is unassigned, so they don't have it at least when this picture, when this table was created, they didn't have an assignment for it. Um, but they do have a name. They, it's funny enough, they don't actually talk, they don't actually put the whole name, they just put the abbreviated name, which I am, uh, don't remember uh, exactly. It's um, the Botrytis Scenaria Mitovirus 1, BCMB1. Okay. So they have this here at the bottom, and that's, you know, then they have the citation here, which is the same paper that I'm talking about right now. Um, but there's also apparently in 2007 this mitovirus was also um, perhaps 2007 is when it was first isolated. I don't know, but if that's the case, we've known about it for about 11 years now, almost 12. Uh, but that's just this one, and helpfully in the table for all uh, what did I say six? Yeah, oh seven. For all seven, they have the uh, fe- what they call the phenotypical changes that happen in the host botrytis. 
and I'm just going to go over those ones. Uh, the first four say none, latent infection, so not very helpful. But the fifth one says reduced sporulation, uh, lacase activity, and invasivity. So the virus really hampers the um, fungus's, the botrytis fungus's um, ability to infect its host, reduces its ability to sporulate, in other words, to create spores, and its lacase activity, which is a physiological process. Um, I mean, obviously, I suppose. But they don't have it assigned to a genus, and they don't have it assigned to a species. Um, which is odd, but apparently the reference report is Castro et al. 2003. And then uh, the sixth one also is just none latent infection. So really the only two virus, Botrytis viruses in this table out of the seven that might be interesting as a biocontrol agent for Botrytis are the one that I'm talking about now, which is the uh, Botrytis scenario mitovirus one, and then this one right here, which doesn't even have a name. But I bet I could probably find it if I tried to. Castro 2003, let me do that right now. I bet, I'll, I, bet I could find it uh, super quickly. If I just put in Castro 2003, try this scenario, scenario virus. Let me just do that. Usually it's that simple. You can follow along at home. <laughs> Okay, so I have this that comes up here. I'm pretty sure it's the paper. Um, a double-stranded RNA mycovirus confers hypovirulence associated traits in Botrytis scenario. Makes sense. Um, they call in the abstract it says Botrytis scenario CCG425 contains a uh, 33 nanometer isometric mycovirus whose genome is a 6.8 kilobyte double-stranded RNA molecule. Virulence bioassays performed by direct plug mycelial inoculation on bean plants showed that Botrytis scenario CCG425, which they really need to find a better name for, uh, displays less fungal aggressivity than Bovaria, than Botrytis scenario CKG54, whatever that is, uh, different strain, a virulent fungal strain that is not infected by double strand RNA mycoviruses. Interesting. Um, this vi this botrytis that was infected by the virus mm -hmm. also showed lower yeah lacase activity and conidiation, which is sporulation. So yeah, for those of you who are coming in right now, I was talking about. Um, viruses, mycoviruses that infect Botrytis scenario, and I was thinking that it's possible that this organism, these organisms that infect Botrytis could be utilized by a control agent in the future, potentially as a way to stop Botrytis from infecting before it starts, or something that you can apply early in an, in an infection in order to severely hamper and uh, retard its growth. Um, but really, I only found two viruses that we know of, at least in this table, that uh, do cause a sort of hypovirulence. Um, the other ones, we don't really know. They don't really have any odd symptoms or anything like that. Maybe in the future we'll find that that's the case, but not here. Anyways, if you want to know more, I have a Botrytis video on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol. Uh, subscribe if you want to see this video on my YouTube channel as well. And um, yeah, so this video in all of its entirety will be on my channel. So you can check that out if you missed it, if you, you know, because I'm going to put this on the Instagram live, but then it's not going to be there forever. It's only going to be there for 24 hours. So if you want to see it and reference it, if you thought any of the concepts here were cool, let me know. Uh, if you liked this, let me know and you will be able to see it on YouTube. So until then, have a good one.